I'm Tammy, a brown belt and coach from the UK. I joined Premium with the free seven day trial about a year ago, and I haven't regretted that once. I immediately binged on some audio content. The Discord server is worth the cost of membership alone. It's uh, a bit like entering a virtual open mat full of white to black belts from various countries. And the vibe's always friendly and respectful and helpful. I highly recommend joining BJJ Mental Models Premium. And I look forward to chatting with you in their Discord server. Those are some words from Tammy. She's one of hundreds of grapplers around the world who have leveled up their jujitsu game with BJJ Mental Models Premium. Join Premium today and you'll get the world's largest library of jiu-jitsu audio courses on strategy and tactics, plus direct coaching from black belt world champions, plus access to the most valuable online jiu-jitsu community. Your first week's free, so please check it out now at bjjmentalmodels.com or check the link in the show notes. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 248. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, man, I'm here with someone that I've been following since I was a little white belt. I'm here with Sean Williams. How's it going, Sean? Hey, great, man. I really appreciate you having me on the show. I am so glad to have you on. The first time, like I said, that you landed on my radar, I was, I think, a white belt, and I heard the story of you inventing the Sean Williams guard and practicing it with Henzo, and I think you were a blue belt at the time, and I thought, man, if if this blue belt can be inventing guards that work and get Henzo's blessing, then you know what? There's hope for me, too. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> There's hope for all of us. <laughs> yeah. well, but, cool. I'm glad I laid the foundation of hope. <laughs> it's a big one, man. <laughs> well, hey, on that note, why don't you go ahead and just give yourself a quick intro for those who maybe aren't Sean Williams enthusiasts like myself. Just tell everyone who you are here. Yeah, sure, man. I'm I'm a fifth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu under Henzo Gracie. I guess it's a I have a long story. So my wife is always like, You gotta shorten this thing because I was like, but it's hard to shorten it. I've been I've been there's a lot of cool stories that I've I've had, um, had the lucky, I was exceptionally lucky to, to land in New York city to train with Henzo. I, I mean, I went there to meet him, but I was very lucky that I, I, I went there first and then just happened to have, uh, my, my instructors and teammates be Matt, Sarah, Ricardo Almeida, Rodrigo Gracie, and then had the pleasure of, of growing up. I, I should say with John Danaher, he and I were colleagues and we talked together and, uh, we both got our black belts in 2002. And then I, I stayed there and taught for a couple more years and then went to open essentially my school called Five Star Martial Arts, which is Henzo Gracie Los Angeles. And it was around 2005 and built that school up to, to be quite a beast. And, and then along the way, became sort of the official commentator. So if you've maybe potentially, if you don't know who I am, but you've maybe heard my voice, been commentating the world and ADCC and, and, and the like for since that time, since about 2006 or seven, I believe is the first time uh, we did the show. And now I am here in Nashville, building a gym here and building a bunch of competitors and having a great time and just trying to make a difference in the world. Hey man, that wasn't so bad. That only took about a minute. Some people, <laughs> well, they come on here and I ask them to tell me about themselves and they go on for the half the show. So yeah, I well, thought that was I, fine. My, my, my wife would like that. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. <laughs> well, hey, man, I mean, when I get to talk to someone like you, the hardest part is always figuring out what topic, because there's so many things to discuss. I mean, the first thing that I thought about was Sean Williams guard. I could ask you a bajillion questions about that. Yeah. But I, I put this in front of my community. And one thing that had been suggested is they had talked about your closed loop approach to teaching. And they said that they thought that would make a phenomenal topic. So if it's good with you, man, I want to talk about this. I'd love to hear about this method and why everyone in my group, at least, is so excited about it and how you use it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's sort of just a, I guess it's, you know, it's a systematic approach. It, it based, it's, you know, it's based on systems, right? I believe that when we get efficient. Now, I do have to say, uh, before we even go down this road, you know, I'm a real fan of context. Like, I believe that without context or contextual knowledge, then, then jujitsu can be really 
bland and you really can't define anything. So for instance, you know, if we're talking about competitors versus hobbyists, I actually like to call people enthusiasts. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I use the word hobbyist, but I'm not a big fan of hobbyists. I don't believe anyone in, in jujitsu just like, oh yeah, that's a hobby. I mean, cause it, it, it'll, it'll save your life. I've had students that have to say, I literally saved their life. So I'm careful when I say hobbyist, even though I say it, I always catch my, I oh, know enthusiast may be better. I don't, I don't know. Athlete. Yeah, sure. But, um, we have to put context and I think everything that we do. And so then we we can make a better assessment of of what it's for. So let's put context in as a closed loop as a general application that will speed up the efficiency of your jujitsu. And so then when you're just playing, right, you don't really care about uh, tournaments or whatever, you should kind of expand your knowledge to just have fun, uh, play in all sorts of different domains, which I believe then increases the likelihood of you having fun and also increases your likelihood of just being uh, overall pretty deep in, in knowledge versus competitors, right? So competitors, sometimes it doesn't behoove them to practice anything outside of a very specific, efficient skill set. Now, that being said, I feel like you, they should know what's going on. I feel like most of the world-class people know exactly what's going on, but but it doesn't mean that they play in those areas very often. When we're talking about closed loops, it can be as big or small as as your as the context of what you're using it for. But in general, what it really is, is I have an approach of jujitsu that, you know, it's pretty simple, right? Where jujitsu, we want to get to the back. And essentially, really, like these days, I have my my competitors getting to the mount more than the back. I've always been a fan, and I think where I came from was a fan of jujitsu for fighting. Like, does it work in in fighting? It's just where where I was sort of brought up. Everybody was fighting around me, and and so I sort of naturally said, "Hey, these things are better for fighting. These things are better for sport." But let's focus on the things that might be a little bit more efficient for for fighting and. and and I, I believe those things bridge the gap of all three departments of jujitsu. But I guess the, the efficiency of what I define as a closed loop goes with my overall approach in so that we all know jujitsu, you, you, the goal, ultimate goal is submitting someone. But behind that, we want to get to the very best position that we can get to, which is I either mount or back, depending on the context, really. And and then control them and then submit them. That that would literally look like UFC one, a perfect match, uh, some someone that puts someone down, passes their guard if they have a guard, goes to the mount, and then gets the back when the person turns over and submits them. That's like a perfect case of efficient jujitsu. And I think pretty much we would all agree with what that would look like and what that is. So in that I I found that, hey, if we're going for a submission and we're say in the mount and it fails. So ultimately we should end in no less than the mount. We should end in no less than an equal position on this little ladder that I have. If you envision a ladder and back control is the top of the ladder, then mount would be the second rung, you know, depends on how you look at things. Turtle might be, turtle top might be the, the third one. Cross side uh, top might be the next one down. Close guard top and then close guard bottom would be the sort of where the line is between closed guard passing and closed guard bottom, you could say that's the middle of the ladder. And if you folded the bottom ladder up, well, then it would be the same, right? Back control bottom would be the very bottom of the ladder. And then you could have a, you'd have a efficient like, hey, I want to move up the ladder and then get up to the top. And then I want to submit someone. And if I fall, if I fail on a submission, my goal is to try to end up at least in that same position, not worse, you know, it, ideally, or potentially even better. And what a what I've defined as a closed loop, because I believe like jujitsu, we always compare it to chess, but it also is like a computer programming. I, I did computer programming. I'm not a computer programmer, Steve. <laughs> the other thing, one thing very straight, but I did it in college for a year and I was like, wow, this is crazy. But jujitsu is literally a bunch of if then statements. There's so many of those things that like when you are in the highest levels, you're like, well, if that happens, you do that. And if that then happens, you do this. And if that happens, then you do this. And so the closed loop theory is essentially if I'm on the mount and I try a, a submission through my training partner's defenses, if that's what happens, I should A, either move up the ladder or if everything fails, if everything goes wrong, 
end up in exactly the same position that I started, which in this case, we'd say if we were on a mount top, I go for Katagatami. He maybe he turns out of Katagatami. I take his back. He escapes the back and I remount him. And as long as you are not over committed to the submission, if you are ahead of the game, generally you should be able to end up in the same position if you have this system all worked out. And so then that's why I define it as a closed loop. It's a loop that it's a sequence that starts in a position that's advantageous for me. I go through my series. You are very good at your defense. And I start immediately back where I where I left off. So really nothing lost, but an incredible amount of, of things gained because you, if I'm talking about you, you're under the gun. The entire time I'm trying my techniques, you're under the gun. And when you escape, if I have the wherewithal of not over committing, I just end up back on the mount. So I tried my moves very efficiently, understand when to let them go when they are failing, and then understand how to get back to that original position if they did fail and that being the worst. If that's the worst thing that happens to you, then you are really in the driver's seat. And I feel like every place in jujitsu has this ability to have a closed loop system. And it can be big. It can be like, one move or it can be five. But the, the thing that begins helping people work this out is that then you start to put priority on submissions. So if we take an arm lock per se from the mount and you move into an arm lock or a jujigatami and you, you go off to the side, it's great pin. But when you actually extend the arm, the pen now weakens because your weight is off of the training, your training partner. And now they have the, the ability to move per se, like a hitchhiker, et cetera, et cetera, whatever they have to move. The minute your back hits the ground and the minute they get out, if they get out, you can still get back to the mount, but it is a very long road. So if we played that out, if you can visualize, I fall for an arm lock, you hitchhiker, I umaplata you, you roll, you say you hit a rolling escape and I'm able to catch your ankle and come right up into the cross side position, get an underhook on the far side and remount you. That took a lot of steps to get there. That took a lot of steps versus if I go for katagatami on the mount per se, you r give me your back to try to escape katagatami. I'm now, I'm in a very good position. So now I go for a gift wrap in the back, if not a rear naked strangle, I, you get smushed, turn if you're lucky and then you're on the mount. So that's way, way, way more efficient because there are just less steps involved and the steps that are involved are pretty one-sided for me. I don't have your weight on me. I'm not using my legs versus your entire body. So if you can think about that from sort of all over jujitsu, it can really start to go, you know, this is a, we can get really efficient here with our attacks because we're the attacks that we're picking and choosing that we're spending the majority of our time on are techniques that put you on the run that don't take long to get back to where I did before if it failed. And so that makes you very efficient at your follow-ups. If there's only two moves to choose from uh, for a defensive purpose, then it's pretty easy to pick out how you react to those defenses. So in a nutshell, that's kind of how the whole entire theory is based. Got it. Got it. I, I love what you're saying here. And it, you know, it reminds me of something we've talked about here on the podcast before, the idea of knowing the risk of everything that you're attempting and what you stand to gain from doing it. What is your return on investment, basically, when you go for a technique? And I have observed that when you're sparring with junior people or even up to purple belt a lot of the time, um, this is just a generalization, but they often don't think about this. They have techniques that they like and they try to go to the techniques that they like, but they don't often think much about well, what do I stand to lose if this doesn't work? What's my plan B? And a lot of the time, people at that level, they'll take crazy risks and they will sometimes lose top position and reverse themselves and wind up on the bottom because they chose a technique or an attack that leaves them wide open if it doesn't work. Whereas I've observed that when I'm sparring with good black belts or even more advanced brown belts, they tend not to make that mistake. They're always trying to choose the tool that will allow them to retain that position even if things aren't going their way or if it doesn't work out. And I love that idea of always trying to trade up, never trying to trade down, never taking a risk that could result in you losing this position that you fought so hard for, but always making sure that even if what you're trying doesn't quite work the way that you want, that you're at least going to wind up in a position that's equivalent to or even better than where you were before. So I remember when this first came to my light or to my eyes, I first realized what a big difference it makes when you start thinking about jujitsu in that way. It was very helpful for me and made it a lot less likely that I was going to do something dumb and wind up on the bottom after I <laughs> fought my way to the top.
Yeah, I love that. That's exactly correct. Like, and just speaking even from retention side, right? So say we're mounted again, because the one thing about closed loops, right? You can't be like, yeah, man, I'm getting out of the back and I ended up with this guy back on my back. Great. Sean told me that this is great. No, no, no. I'm not talking about like getting getting defensively. Like closed loops are not made for defense. I'm primarily on off, you know, we're talking about offensive things, but um, say we're even retention sake. So say we are mounted and someone elbow escapes and traps our ankle. If we're not just so fixated on my gosh, my ankle is stuck. I have to maintain that. I have to, if you understand this early. So even from the mount, I'll give you an example of sort of philosophy I have from the mount. If two arms are down, at your waist and you are dealing with a very experienced person, I dismount them almost immediately. But the way that we dismount is that my fist is already pummeling in with weight in your far arm. Generally, it's usually your far arm. So when we pummel off or I pummel off, when you turn, you, you'll, you'll miss your elbow escape in a perfect world. And then you'll turn into me because there's the, the likelihood that you're going to turn away is, is unlikely. But if you did, you'd give the back. So an individual will generally turn to you and then you have a now you have an underhook. And so then when you have an underhook and your knee is still on their, your shin is still on their stomach, then you're just immediately moving right back to the mount. And then you're mounted with an arm up and in line with the shoulder. And that plays bodes itself very well to my, the mounted approach that I take where I call that half, like uh, two arms out in line with the shoulders are full T and then just one arm out. I just call it half T to be simple, but then you're there. And so that essentially was a closed loop. I, it wasn't like a, I'm attacking your, the katagatami, but I'm on the mount. You went to get out and I just said, hey, I'm going before your your move really sets in. I'm going to go off the mount. And when you turn, I'm underhooking and you go and I'm going back to the mount. And it, it's little things like that. When you have them worked out, you have a different mindset. All of a sudden, it's not such a big deal if you lose the mount or if you lose a position because you're backed up. You know, you know what's coming because you've done it and rehearsed it over and over and then you can be just ahead of the game. And it's it leaves very little room for the person that's getting out defensively to really work. They, they then have to have a really high intellect of what is exactly about to happen. Like when someone dismounts you, then you need to go, wow, this I just got dismounted and there's a un- potential underhook happening when I turn. So I need to pummel. And so then it just starts, it just gets bigger and bigger, all the, all of these things. And so we can look at it as well as for positional retention. But yeah, in my opinion, it makes jujitsu a little bit easier to navigate. Same with the leg locks, right? So legs have always been around Henzo's. We've had, I mean, it's like my first day, I always tell my, tell everybody, my first day was a cross heel hook. That's, that's what I learned my first day of jujitsu was uh, the person on the bottom was elbow escaping. We were on top and you went right into a cross Ashi heel hook. And see, that was the first lesson I ever had. But we always had this approach of heel hooks are great in the right place and they serve their purpose. But if we overcommit on the heel hook, you're going to end up in a bad position. Whereas if you don't overcommit on a heel hook, just like I was talking about Katagatami, and someone goes into a defensive set of sequences, then you should at least end where you were, or ideally what you were discussing is better. You're in a better position and you're not chasing the leg around until you end up in a horrible position and stacked and mounted and et cetera, et cetera. So I I think it just really helps start to have people work that out in their head. Absolutely. I love that bit too, about making sure that in the event that you do think you're going to lose the position, you start setting yourself up for success so that you can get right back to it again later common mistake people make is if they feel like they're going to lose mount, they just try to mount harder. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, they, just yeah, try, yeah. they just try to hold on for dear life. And usually yeah. that what that winds up doing is putting you on the bottom um, or getting you pushed back into a half guard or even full guard. Whereas if you set up something like a good underhook, you can then dismount and then upon their movement, just remount right again. And of course, um, if this is a, a tournament setting, that's that's point farming, right? You're going to get a lot of points <laughs> if the person pushes you off and then you just go right back to that position. So I would say that's an important point of understanding too, is that trying to cling on to a failing position usually isn't the best strategy, but you can set yourself up so that if you have to temporarily move away, you can come right back to that without having to cede side control or an inferior position and lose the good stuff. Yeah, correct. Correct. So I would want to know here, practically speaking, I think probably most people will hear this conversation and they'll say, yeah, that makes sense. Ideally, you don't want to trade down. You don't want to take a risk 
lose the position that you fought so hard for and wound up somewhere else. But the question then that will often come up is how do you do it from a practical standpoint? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if um, from your teaching, you find that this varies depending whether you're on bottom guard or topside mounts or what have you. But I would love to know, practically speaking, what are some tactics or tips that you could use to make sure that you enforce that closed loop when you're on the attack? Yeah, that's a great question. The approach when we have training, first of all, it, so again, this depends on context, right? So so I've got a group here in Nashville, small, very dedicated group. We're about a year and three quarters in of a four-year cycle. We are on a four-year cycle because I believe that that's a very good amount of time to program in these things. It takes about four years. It's an Olympic cycle. That's There's some definitely some real benefit in having long-term planning with these short mini cycles in between. But in my competitors, and they do things different. I mean, they they all have these goals of succeeding in, in the highest levels of competition. And this means that there is no wasted time on things that aren't going to make sense in the particular environment that they want to be in. That is vastly different than a an approach for someone that really just wants to be involved in jujitsu, is going to be involved for the next rest of their life, and has the the benefit of time to really learn everything, right? So coaching or teaching is something that I believe as an instructor, you need to really deep dive and and play and be pretty well versed in many, many, many areas because you're going to teach it and you need to, you need to understand a lot. Competitors, on the other hand, nah, they really just need to understand what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, why they're supposed to do it, and then be well versed in things that are around it. And so with that in mind, we already have a lot of systems worked out. They're just worked out. What's efficient from the closed guard? And then what with that in mind, what are our loops from these different positions? If we, if I'm dealing with someone who's just in it for the long term, we could say, hey, close guard. What are we doing in close guard? Well, posture. Right? First of all, you, if, if you don't have control of somebody's head and they get their arms straightened in a manner that you can't bring them down, well, your close guard's pretty much done. It's better to open when people are on the ground than it is when they're on the feet in general. So then you would already have to have moved on. But let's just say we're, we're using the thing about the closed loop. I taught a seminar in, in L.A. with my very good student named Alex on who who has common ground in Pasadena and in all the guys that I've been teaching for years in LA, we taught, I taught this and it was really the exercise of the seminar by the end of the seminar was to get these guys thinking about, Hey, if I want to make a closed loop, like exactly what you're saying, if I want to make a closed loop, what do I need to do? Because the jujitsu that I want to use necessarily the jujitsu that you like to use, because it is your, it's, Jiu-jitsu is like a painting, right? It's like a canvas. You paint your own jujitsu based on your personality and what things that you like to do, even if they're inefficient. And if you don't have to win a world title, and even so, maybe if you do, uh, you can go outside the realm of efficiency just for fun, for pure fun and and personality. So we'll just pick the the good old arm lock from the closed guard. Like, wham, you hit an arm lock. This person defends, right? So they you stack me. If now I need to be prepared for that. If my arm lock is failing, I need to be prepared for my secondary attack, which if you stack and I go under your leg, I might sweep you to your back. This potential, right? I might sweep you to your back. Now, here's another opportunity for me to either stay on the arm. I could stay on the arm or I could try to mount you. If I mounted you, boom, that was that's that's sort of a one loop to the other. It's no, no longer a closed loop. Let's just say it is going to be a closed loop. I sweep you to your back and you immediately, I try to straighten your arm. You immediately hit a hitchhiker and wham, I put you back in your guard off your hitchhiker. There's a closed loop. And so if you need, how you do this in practice is you have to develop this or you through your coach or instructor. Um, but I would behoove everyone to take their own responsibility and based on your personality and you work this out. You, It's like a flow chart. You're going to work out like if I go for an arm lock, then what happens? What can happen? And then how am I going to react when that happens? So now I'm going to have to have it hit another move or, hey, if the person stacks, you go right back to your guard. That's that's a very short closed loop. You tried. They defended. You go right back to the guard. Could be as easy as that. Doesn't have to be complicated. Could be as easy as that. I have a saying and closed loops are sort of a system, right? So I do have a, a saying that systems don't have to be complicated. They just need to be complete. And when you are talking about closed loop, that's the same. You need to have a complete structured environment around your offense, a particular reaction, and then your reactions until they either get you in a better place 
or you return back to where you came from. And the way that you can do this as well in practice, what we talked about is overcommitment on the mount. We talked about that earlier. I'm a big believer that every technique has a window and it's and the window closes, right? It's open in the beginning and it closes. When that window is at its most open, um, obviously this changes with experience. I don't like to say, oh yeah, that guy's a black belt. So boy, like his windows are going to stay open for so long and he's going to understand exactly when that window is open. I don't like to talk about belts. I like to talk about experience because a white belt that plays any sort of guard enough could have more experience. Now, this would be difficult, but he could, could. Hey, he could generate more experience than a black belt in that particular instance. So that person that has a, a lower rank could, their windows, not only one, understand when the window just is opened and they might have a slower closing window through experience. So they might have what feels like a lot longer to react. And that's what we feel like when we're lower belts training with a black belt. We're just like, well, that move looks the same, but how come they can do it to me and I can't do it to them, right? It, it's that window. It feels like, well, that, that was so fast. But then when you get experience in something, you all of a sudden you're like Neo in the matrix, right? You're dodging bullets in slow motion. You're like, wow, that was, how did I do that? When like, you know, five years ago, I felt like that was impossible. It's your experience levels, right? It's nothing, nothing to do with what you've got tied around your waist. It's your experience levels. And so through experience, these windows can stay open much longer and they close. They just close slower. But what happens is you acknowledge, okay, there's the time. That's it. The window is open. I'm going to go now. And you only have until that window closes until that, that opportunity is now gone. Through experience, both defense through your training partner and through your experience, because if they're very experienced, that window is going to close very, very quickly. Right. So, so for instance, like a hitchhiker, right. You straighten an arm and that person hasn't left already, then poof, that's going to be a very slow and, and painful hitchhiker before you even break their grip. Or as you break their grip, they throw their arm into you. It creates that space. They're out. And you're like, that was the fastest hitchhiker that I've ever had in my life on an arm lock because they knew they knew when to go, what, what it felt like, and that window just opened and wham, they're out of there. And so for you, when you're doing the closed loop, you have to be really cognitive of when these windows open and close so that you can keep the windows open through movement and that gets you back to where you started. Or if you're really paying attention, it gets you into a better position because you're just moving moving on. And that, and that also comes with experience. So I wouldn't expect a person that's been training for three months or I mean, even a month, I wouldn't expect them to go like, Hey, I got this clo close guard thing all worked out. I mean, you may have arm lock to back to arm lock. That's a great start, but you may not have arm lock. This guy stacks me. I sweep him down and I, and he hitchhikers. I get a normal plata. He rolls through. Then I, he rolls into my guard. And I got a close guard. It may, it may not be that worked out yet because you need some experience to grow, but that's sort of how you can practice this. You can flow chart it out. You can mind map it out, whatever you want to call it. And then just work out all of the possibilities that exist with that. And as you grow in experience, you're going to see that there becomes a lot more possibilities. And then your challenge is going to be like, how do I narrow these possibilities so that I'm much more efficient in nature, especially for competitors. So that's just sort of how we do it here and how I teach, like, especially the people that are just having fun, start to give them that power of like, oh, wow, this is cool. I get to like almost essentially kind of build my own game uh, through experience. Yeah, I love that analysis there. I love you talking about windows of opportunity because you're absolutely right. When you're in there with a lower rank person, they leave the window wide open, which is why it's so easy for a black belt to just walk in and sweep a white belt while, without even really trying. But yeah, when you're in there with someone who's experienced, the window is very, very small, if it's open at all. Yeah, that's right. A lot of the time, yeah, a lot of the time against a good black belt, the window is closed and <laughs> your first job is private that fucker open a crack because you're not going to be able to get anything done. Um, so that is a really important thing to understand. And a, a very common mistake that a lot of people make, um, especially the so-called hobbyists I find, and it might stem from confidence or lack of experience, is they won't seize the opportunity when it comes. The window will be open and they hesitate for just half a second. And that's too long against a good person. So a big part of conditioning is making sure that you recognize those windows and you can move without hesitation. That's why, you know, you brought up the hitchhiker escape. There is a move where the window against a good black belt, if 
if it's open at all, is going to be very, very narrow. And if you have to stop and think about, okay, what do I do here? What's the best, what's the best technique to escape this? And you got to run through all of those in your mind too late. You're already cooked, right? So that's right. That's, <laughs> so that's part of the benefit of training is you internalize all of those movements so that it's not your brain doing the thinking anymore. It's your body doing the thinking. It just knows and it just does the right move and you don't have to stop and process it cognitively, which is, that's why we train, right? It's to move all of that stuff into the muscle memory so that we don't hesitate and lose that window. That's correct. And th and that's where you really get the difference between a competitor and someone that's really just like, hey, I'm in this for the long haul. I don't have to be super efficient right away. That repetition and that working these things out, that's the difference, right? That's the difference of being just lightning fast. I, there's a, uh, a wonderful student that I've, I've spoken with at my good friend, uh, Warren Stout School. Um, she is a neuroscientist. And so we got to talk as she was at one of my camps in, in Costa Rica. We got to talking. It was a fascinating talk because she's like in the research department. So she, this stuff she's been studying for a very long time. And she was studying a very famous boxer. You know, the name, I should have texted her before this. Hey, what's the name of the boxer? But, but I, I believe it was Joe Lewis, but don't quote me on that. It might've been Sugar Ray Robinson. It was one of the greats, right? And they studied the time that it took for his right hand to land after someone had been, it was a counter right, right? He was very good at a counter right. They timed it. And what they found was that it was impossible, impossible for it to be a reaction because the mind, when you see something, the nervous system could not respond in a reactive state as fast as what he responded. So what they found was it reflex. He had done this so many times that it became reflexive in nature because a reflex is much faster than a reaction. And so what we're trying to build in, in what I'm trying to build on my athletes is that these things are reflect, reflexive, not reactive. And so if someone moves in a very specific way where their hands are becoming down, we'll use the mount again, they've bumped up, here comes their arms down, then we need to rehearse this so many times that it becomes as close to reflexive as possible. That way we have the best chance of being as smooth, as fast, and we don't hesitate because it's not a reaction anymore. It's now as reflexive as it could be, which in my humble opinion is I'm not even sure if that's going to be possible, but that's what we're building off of. So that can hopefully get rid of all of the hesitation is just that so we've done this so many times, the neurons have spun around that little, it's done that spindle so many times, and it's the same move over and over and over that now we're building reflexes instead of reactions. That's actually one of my favorite things about getting high level competitors on this podcast is you ask them questions and they have to explain things that they do every day, but they haven't really thought deeply about in a long time yeah. because these things that beginners have to think deeply about, like, okay, where do I put my arm? Where do I put my foot? An expert has done so many times, the body is just on autopilot. And so when I get them on this podcast and I say, okay, you have no video, you have no visual aids. You cannot just do the move and tell people to copy you. You have to explain with your words how you're going to do a knee cut pass. Like it just breaks people because they have to take these things and put it in reverse now. And all of this stuff that they've internalized, they got to load it back up into their brain again. And I've had people come on here before when we do very technical conversations and they say, man, this was like the hardest thing I've ever had to do. That's right. <laughs> because, because you're engaging a different part of your body. You're engaging the cognitive part of your brain instead of the, the muscle memory, which is what you normally want to use when you're actually competing. This is exactly right. And this is why teaching is the highest level of learning. It's the highest level. And exactly for the reason why you just said, when you have to teach it and you have to explain it, it's a whole nother level. You all of a sudden continue. Like when I started teaching at Henzo's, we didn't have like a set curriculum where, where he would teach us, we would teach. We just got to teach. And it was either teaching, essentially regurgitating what he had taught us. And even though you learned it when you were he was teaching you and you were learning it like you and then you're doing it right you're doing it on these people like high level people we're we got like world champions coming in and visiting and we're doing these techniques on other world champions then when you go and you teach it it's almost like you learn it again and you're just like ah oh, that's why i do that but i knew why i i thought i knew why i did that because hens was like the best teacher on the planet and he told me why i did that but then when i you regurgitate it you're all of a sudden like there's something else that clicks in your brain and you're like Oh, that's why I do that. Like, duh. Yeah. But yeah, you already knew that. So just exactly what you said. I, I, that's why I always say 
the, the highest level of learning is teaching. Everyone should teach, even if it's just for fun, because it's a whole nother, a whole other thing teaching. It will paradoxically make you better at jujitsu to teach other people because you will start to question and think more deeply about things that you probably never thought about. People will ask you questions and then you'll realize, I actually have no idea. I've never <laughs> thought about it. I, you ask me why I put my hand there. I don't know. Some guy told me to do it 10 years ago and I've been doing it every day since. And it opens up your own mind and it makes you question things that you never questioned. You know, teachers always get a bad rap. There's that stupid old saying about how if you can't do, then teach. Yeah, right. I'd say the opposite is also true. If you can't teach, then do. They're two completely different skill sets and not everyone is blessed enough to be good at both of them. Um, but I would say don't sleep on the importance of being a good teacher. It is one of the best ways to learn. A hundred percent. A student of mine sent me this article from, it was in a Harvard Business Review. Um, it was really neat because it was a study on reflection. And so they, they did a study, I think it was a call center that they had done a study on. And they essentially, they had a control group, which just basically worked. And then over the course of that day, whatever they worked on, they were tested on. The control group did, that's it. They just worked. I believe it was an eight hour day. Don't quote me on that one, but I believe it was an eight hour work day. And they did this for several weeks and then they were tested. The second group was, we'll just call them group A. And group A got to work 15 minutes less every day, but then they got to write what they learned. They said, hey, they, you go and reflect on what you learned today. And we're going to give you that 15 minutes of time to do that. And then group three or group B was the same as group two. So or group B, group A is they got a 15 minutes less, but not only did they reflect on it, they shared it. So they talked about it with their peers. So they got to teach it more or less. They got to explain what they did. The control group, uh, once they got their standard tested uh, done, they found that the group that reflected just by writing it down, not sharing, performed 22.8% better on the tests. And then the, the, the last group, the one that taught, performed 25% better than the control group. So there was that 3% difference um, from teaching it over just the people who reflected it, which I, I found like that was like, wow, that's cool. That's a great study, great proof. And then this goes in point of what do you do as a student to get better? If I told everyone on this, the audience today, hey, I have this really good secret. I can make you 22.8% better. Do you want to hear how to do it? And they'd be like, oh, like, yeah, of course. Take notes. <laughs> and then they go, oh, okay. <laughs> You want to, what, what about, hey, if I could make you 25% better, would you really want to know? And like, yeah, 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 yeah. Take notes and then tell somebody about it or teach. Well, you know what? This touches on something you talked about earlier, and I want to get I want to get your opinion on this, but I'm pretty sure I already know what you're going to say. But let's get it on record anyway. So <laughs> you talked earlier about how you don't like to think about people in terms of belts, but more in terms of experience level. A common thing that you will hear people say is that you should not be teaching at all until your belt level X. I know people, instructors that I respect greatly, who say that they don't let white belts teach at all in class. Basically, if the white belt wants to talk and explain something, they're just not allowed to do it. I would want to know what your thoughts are on that. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. So let me ask you, I remember what I said about context, right? Mm -hmm. That I, I told you on one, there is no question that, <laughs> that this is like, this is the best part and the worst part of, 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 of having me on a show. Very rarely is there ever a question that I'm going to answer without some sort of context. What if that white belt was Henry Cejudo? Yeah. Would that guy still say that that guy can't teach? Exactly. <laughs> anyway, let's let, let's not say that. Let's just say that this is a guy off the street, right? No experience. You know, look, I started teaching when I was a blue belt. This was at Henzo Gracie Academy. This was from one of the best to ever do it. And it was very, very limited in nature. I, I He let me take a private on. And it was just like a guy came to the school, a music guy, and had no aspirations of, of competing or anything like this, and but just a very nice human being. And he, he, and he said, hey, Sean, I want you to teach him. And I was, it was late blue belt. Said, wow, wow. And I'm honored. So cool. Now here's the thing, right? And this isn't just me talking about it. Like training is training, right? And I, my experiences were very different. I, I was training, you know, this is another contextual fact here. I was training on average, probably six to eight hours a day. And then it got even more than that. When I started the early morning, when I was purple belt, I think John and I were in the gym, probably a good 14 hours a day, maybe 15 hours a day. Cause I started a 7 AM class there. And I was, so I was essentially at Henzo's with minor breaks, walking out, getting lunch from seven in the morning until 11 at night, more or less Monday through Friday. And then 
about five to six hours on Saturday and about five to six hours on Sunday. So I was a real loser, like as far as like <laughs> time, time went, right? But, but so, so there's a context to that too. Like I had a lot of experience under my belt and, but I was still a blue belt, right? So I had a, but I have a lot of experience in what I did. And then he let me teach. And shortly after that, I got my purple belt and I became an avid teacher in the gym from that point forward. So here's another story, right? So there, there's a white belt. I have a story of, we were doing a move in the gym, in the academy, and it happened to be like a neck crank, essentially like a old school sort of neck crank that we were working on. And a guy co- says something like, uh, Henzo, can you help me with this? Like he's strangling me. I'm, I'm choking. I'm, I'm tapping from a choke. And he's, I was like, I shouldn't be a choke. So he walked over and this guy was essentially doing the move incorrectly. He was not doing it right, but essentially it was a closed card buggy choke more or less. It was a closed guard triangle with him with an elbow deep underneath his far leg. And, and Henzo was like, let me get in there. Let me feel this. You're choking. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm strangling. He's like, okay, let me feel this. And he gets in there and he's like, okay, go for it. And the guy does it. And he sits in there for a second and, and he taps. He goes, let me feel it one more time. Let me feel it a couple more times. He fell a couple more times. He's like, man, Hey guys, come over here. And he literally <laughs> taught that move. And he was like, I want you guys to see like, this is uh this is legit. I'm just felt it. And this is a legit choke. That was a white belt making a mistake. Now, could that have white belt have taught it? Most likely not. Now, if the white belt has enough experience in one thing, then sure. Like, I'll tell you, if this white belt has done the elbow escape a thousand times, is really efficient at it, but can't pass the guard to save his life then maybe this guy, our gal, might be somebody that's good for you, him to like, you know what, This a, there's another new guy. Hey, will you teach him the elbow escape? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. As long as the instructor knows it's all worked out and it's not just some random teaching. And because I, I think there needs to be some rules in the gym, right? Somebody just can't be teaching why another guy's teaching or anything like this. I, be, I believe there needs to be order in the gym, but but like I, I would have no problem having a very experienced individual teaching a lesser experienced person, no matter what their belt was, if they were vetted more or less, if they're vetted and they know how to teach, I think there's, you know, there's a lot to coaching and teaching as far as like do's and don'ts. And I have a very thorough instructor training program that like not even talking about technique first, it's always talking about like the approach that we have for coaching. So, but I would have no problem with that whatsoever. I think that is important as long as it's useful and it's vetted then sure. Yeah, I love that take there. I think that the context matters a ton. 100%. It's one thing, yeah, it's one thing if it's a two-stripe white belt who sees that the day one new guy is struggling with a cross choke and wants to give him some pointers, right? That's one Uh thing. It's another thing if the two-stripe white belt goes on Reddit and publishes a whole treatise about how Lachlan Giles is wrong and is an idiot, right? They're, they're very different kinds of things, right? There Some, we go. Sometimes, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. The, the thing that I just worry about is I never want to shut the door to people and say, you are not allowed to teach anything specifically because of your belt rank. Because like right. you said, the belt doesn't mean that much in terms of knowledge. There might be areas where that person, either through hard work or luck or just mistake, as in the case you brought, has stumbled onto something that no one else has. Yeah. And beyond that, as you already talked about, one of the best ways to learn is to teach. I love the idea of jujitsu as a laboratory style environment where people collaborate and they help each other. And you can't do that if you tell your white belts, you're not allowed to talk to the other white belts and teach them stuff. Yeah, correct. I think, uh, and to your point, like where (laughs) this might be a little bit off top, we are in the point where, so I I did karate when I was a kid. That, That was what I had available. And I was very lucky actually, to be honest with where I train. I didn't even realize that until I was like training shoot boxing and like doing things with, I was like, wow, wait a minute. I think I was very lucky where I came up. Um, But beside the point, we we are, jujitsu is in this place now where we are exactly in the place where karate died, where there was two different paths right here that we're already taking. We're seeing it all the time. It's like what you just said, that because of the internet, the internet is both the best and the worst, just like the yin and the yang of life. Most of the time, the best thing that you have in your life could also be the worst thing that you have in your life. The internet is sort of the same for us in jujitsu. We're we're at that point where anyone can just pick up a camera and start teaching and, and going on a tangent. And it's very hard to understand if they're not known, if they're vetted, or not. I mean, I think that's where we do have to be careful about that, right? So some people are brazen and they're like, this is, they teach and they're funny or whatever. They can have an an online persona and they can, they can get more credit than, than it's worth. But, uh, on the flip side, if somebody is vetted, like we were talking about, if they have experience, they're vetted, they, they understand what's going on and they can teach in limited capacities, even if they're quote unquote, a white belt, then, Hey, great, great. 
that is a very good thing. When, when we're talking about online because of, of the way that things are structured and that's where there's no real vetting process and that, that sometimes can be a little bit of a, a problem. Although I don't have a problem with anybody seeing everything. I, I feel like seeing everything is good. You know, like even if it's the most clownish stuff ever, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. It's great. Let's, let's see anything and see if it's worth it. And then if it's not worth it, then great, we scrap it. But if it's if it's something that's very cool or working at the highest levels, hey, great, then we can use it. But anyway, it's a little off tangent, but it's along the same lines of like having someone that's got a lot of experience in one little thing or no, and very little in the rest, as long as they're in that little, their little strong suit, no problem. I don't see a problem with it. Nice, nice. Now, something else I want to dig into that you mentioned earlier, um, you were talking about when you're attempting a technique to know in your mind what that if this, then that flow chart looks like and what are the, the good things that can happen and also what are the bad things? This is an idea that you hear talked a lot about in judo. I mean, they have the idea of a sacrifice technique. The idea being that you better get this technique because if you don't, it's going to go real bad for you. Yes. And many of many of those techniques do bleed through into jujitsu, especially some of the takedowns. But I would argue that there's a lot of sacrifice techniques you can do on the ground, both from the bottom and the top, where the level of commitment that you have to put into it is is very high. So if you're going to do that technique, you better be real sure that you're going to get that technique because otherwise you lose the whole thing. Um, a common mistake that white belts will make, for instance, is they're on top. They think maybe there is an arm bar, but they don't really have it, but they go for it anyway. And they wind up falling off the person because they don't really have their weight placed on them. They're not holding them tight enough. Now they've lost the whole thing, right? I remember going through this when yeah. I was a white belt. I was like, arm bars for a mount don't work because every time I try this, it, you know, I always wind up on the bottom. I mean, <laughs> now that's one of my highest percentage moves because yeah. I just don't do that anymore. But I would want to get your thoughts on that, on the idea of committed techniques in jujitsu and how you factor that into your decision making. Like, do you think about that? You know, what's the, how much commitment am I putting into this and what can go wrong if I mess it up? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. So again, it, it falls along the lines of who are we talking about and what's for, but I feel like in general, when people are in this for the long haul, right? Maybe, you know, when I talk about competitors, I think, you know, since I've been in this game a long time, oftentimes I make the mistake of thinking about competitors that start jujitsu when they're 21. If you're starting when you're 21, you really need to be efficient of like what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're doing it. If you, if that's your goal, like, man, I want to win this or like, I'm shooting to be the best that I can be. And I want to be there by the time I'm 26 or 27, at least to have a good start on it. You've got to be efficient or you have to have 14 hours a day to do what I'm about to say. I think you need to play everywhere. I always say easiest to get into cold water. The easiest way to get in cold water is to jump. It's not to put your foot in, especially if it's like a cold plunge, like it's not a good idea to put your toe in. You might second guess things. But if you jump in the water too late, you're in. Now you've got to deal with that. So in competition, I feel like that's a great approach to learn is to just, you just got to, you go with it. Don't worry about the consequences when you're learning things. You just try. And then you work out through experience what your mistakes were, because by trying, you open up all the possibilities for a mistake to happen if you're conservative and you don't even do it until things are perfect it's going to be a very very long road for you to get through all navigate all the if then statements that are going to happen because you may not even allow them to open so when you're learning and you're first doing it fuck ah, Jeez, th throw caution to the wind. Obviously, if it's not going to hurt your training partner, you, you just try to do things. And that way you get on with it. Essentially, you're jumping in the cold water. You know, you have to get in the cold water at some point. Like that's the other thing. You know, you're going to have to go in there whether you want to or not to be very good at jujitsu. So you might as well just do it right away and then scale it back as you get better and better and better. So then you're like, hey, you know what? When I'm doing an arm lock from the mount, my knee never went past his head. I didn't slide my first knee up there past his head. I was always down by the shoulder and then my hip alignment was not where it was supposed to be. It wasn't lined up with his shoulders. It was lined up sort of at an angle. And that's why now it's been failing. And 
you get that stuff all worked out from the beginning. And if you're really lucky, you have a great instructor that understands all those things so that they help you work it out even faster. But I feel like just go, just keep going and trying things and it makes your learning process that much more enjoyable. Well, sometimes maybe not because you're getting smushed more, but that's okay. That should be enjoyable. You're trying, you're trying. That means that you're going to succeed much faster because you're going to fail much faster so that you're going to work all those things out. You're going to try over and over. It's just like we were talking about earlier. You've got to try, you've got to have something repeated thousands and thousands of times before it's actually so efficient that you don't have to think about it anymore. And so the only way to do that is to try it and get those things out of the way as quickly as possible and then, and have fun doing it and not really care at all what happens. Like my approach to takedowns is, is that like the whole game of takedowns isn't judged until the transition is over Once it's on the ground, that's a takedown to me. It doesn't matter if I'm shooting the double leg and putting you down or if I'm shooting the double leg and then you're going down and then I immediately get sumigashi because you put a hook in as you were going down and and now I'm on the bottom. Like who won that? Who was really the person that ended in the best position? You were. I might have instigated the takedown, but it really didn't do very, do me very well. I feel like things like that are a bit more important. So the approach of how do I get to the back or how do I get to the mount? And I, and it doesn't matter how long it takes me to get there. Even if I try an arm lock and I fail, but then I have some follow-up or maybe I don't and I tap and I learn and that's it. You just get on with it quicker. You know, that's a really interesting insight because one of the things about jujitsu is you can really slow the game down to your comfort level. Uh I mean, look, if I want to, I can go in there and slap hands and bump fists and hold someone in my clothes guard for 10 minutes, right? There's nothing stopping me from doing that as long as I I have the technical savvy to do it. And sometimes that makes jujitsu athletes a little bit gun shy to try these high commitment techniques. I have definitely felt this in myself where when I try to do judo, it's very different because I mean, if you want to execute a lot of judo techniques, you've got to go, right? You can't just, you can't half-ass your way into an uchimata. You have to be willing to throw your whole body into Uh it. It's a high commitment technique. And for a lot of jujitsu people, that can be real scary. First of all, because there's always the what if, right? Like what if I fuck this up and I wind up on turtle and now I've given up the whole thing. Whereas in jujitsu, it's possible to be that slow boa constrictor who just never leaves an opening, or at least it appears that way. So I think maybe for some people, it's hard for them to embrace those high commitment techniques because like you said, only way to get good at them is to do them. But if you're afraid of failing, you're never going to do them in the first place. So you got to kind of get over that fear and attempt those things before you have any chance of getting them to the point where they're good enough to really execute on someone. That's 100% correct. And maybe if someone's out there hearing this, they go like, hey, say you're going to do a six minute round in the gym. Maybe then you say, hey, your goal is to get to the back. And you shouldn't be happy until you get to the back. Not happy. You know what I'm saying? You shouldn't be, I don't want you to stop your sequences and your movement until you get to the back. And once you're to the back, then you can try to strangle. But that's the ultimate goal for the six minute round. And you're starting on your closed guard. Go. That's the goal. Then you've got to open up. You're not going to get to the back by staying in closed guard. And so maybe that might help some of those individuals. There's something that for competitors and for, you know, I guess everybody in general, this is be something that I, I feel very strongly about is when you start jujitsu or you start to take a liking to it and understand like, hey, this is something I'm I'm really thinking that's really cool. I dig this and it's good for me and good for my life. People need to understand or think about what is it that your jujitsu wants to look like? What do you want to look like when you're doing jujitsu? Do you want to submit everybody that you train with? Or do you want to pin someone on the bottom and, and be happy with that? What is it that it wants to be? Now, majority, I could probably safely answer for almost everybody on the planet that they want to be a submission machine. Everybody goes like, who's the best pound for pound guy I ever lived? Hodger, right? Hodger Gracie. I think that most of us would agree with it's Hodger. Why? Well, he submitted everybody, right? He wasn't like overly explosive or exciting, but the end was almost always the same. Somebody getting submitted in a pretty dominant way. So if that's your goal, if your submission is your goal, then you need to essentially train with control like that as your mindset. So you're not, you can't just sit in a closed guard. Like you've got to, you really have to open up in an effort to make that your long term. That's the long term goal. And I, you want to be good enough everywhere. Then you submit everyone, you know, in theory, 
that's your goal. But you've got to do that from the beginning because it sure is better to do that from the beginning and think that that's the way I'm going to build my jujitsu. So if I'm going to build my jujitsu like that, then I need to do so from the very beginning instead of just building my jujitsu to be gun shy. As you said, I, I believe that that's a very valid point because once you've trained something over and over and over, then it might actually start to get really hard for you to open up because you become mildly afraid or mildly like, hey, I don't have the offense to open up anymore. And I feel like if you do this from the beginning, then it will help and it will work out in your favor in the end. Amazing, Sean. Amazing. Hey, before we tie this one up, anything you wanted to talk about on the topic of closed loops that we didn't get into yet? Or do you think we covered everything? I mean, I think I think we've got it pretty much down, I, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, do write in and let us know if you agree or disagree. But in the interim, Sean, if people want to check out your work, if they want to learn from you or follow you, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, thanks, uh, Steve. I'm on Sean Williams BJJ on Instagram. I'm, uh, you can go to my website, SeanWilliamsBJJ.tv, although I should be getting complete with SeanWilliams.com. Obviously, it's S-H-A-W-N Williams.com pretty soon. And then and feel free to shoot me questions. I also have it on my online platform called JujitsuEDU.com. And you know, I get some stuff out on Fanatics. If you are a big Fanatics fan, then I've got some things there as well. Amazing. Well, as I always do, I'll put all of those links in the show notes to make it easy for people. I'll also put a link to our stuff, BJJMentalModels.com is where everything lives. Uh, getting close to 250 episodes of the podcast. So there's a massive back catalog if people want to dig through our old stuff, all of which is in, intended to be just as relevant today as it was back then. Um, also, you can get on our newsletter. We send out some awesome thought pieces as well as show notes every week, completely free. Beyond that, if you want to dig in deeper with us, I definitely recommend checking out our premium service, BJJ Mental Models Premium. The main reason you'd want to sign up for that, number one, you get access to our massive course library, tons of courses on on strategy, tactics, uh, and other insights from some of the best minds in the sport. We've got some new ones up there by Claudia Duvall, Rafael Lovato Jr., Brianna St. Marie. So definitely recommend that. You also get direct coaching from us. So send us your videos. We'll break them down. Um, it's not just my dumb ass, as I've said before. We've got an amazing review team, including Brianna St. Marie, uh, Margot Ciccarelli, a lot of other world-class black belts. Um, we're always trying to add more value to premium, and the first week is free. So please do consider checking it out if you haven't already. It's all at BJJ Mental models.com again link in the show notes but sean thanks so much for coming by man this one was a bucket list item for me and i'm just so glad i finally got to have you on here such a pleasure man thank you steve i appreciate it and uh love doing it thanks man thanks to the listeners too appreciate you as well we'll talk to you next week take care